So I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 18 as we continue to see when the gospel goes. If you're using one of those church Bibles, little red Bibles near around you, we're going to be on page 985. And then, as always, everything's in the Version Bible app as well. You can just go to More and click on today's event, and you can find all the scriptures in there as well. Today we're going to see Paul arrive in Corinth as we look at the first 17 verses here of chapter 18. Acts 18, starting in the first verse, says, After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians were, when they heard, believed, and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking, and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. While Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or of a serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, See to it yourselves. I refuse to be judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But none of these things mattered to Galileo. This is God's word. Will you please bow your heads with me as we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that we have this opportunity to gather together, Lord, to open your word and hear from you this morning. Lord, as, as we prepare to dive in here and, and look at Paul's uh, missionary journey here in Corinth, Lord, I pray that you would open our minds and ears to hear your voice. Speak to us today, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. May we leave here changed by the power of the gospel, Lord, and by your word. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, church, I have a confession to make. I am what the experts call an amateur golfer. Emphasis on amateur. <laughs> I, I love golf, but I'm kind of an amateur at it. I'm new at it. Actually, I had the opportunity to go to Top Golf this week. Anybody ever been to Top Golf? I love Top Golf. I went there this week with my dad, and a lot of people love Top Golf because you can play Angry Birds. They have an Angry Birds game there. Kids love that. I love it because you can eat while you golf. <laughs> like anytime I can combine food and an activity, I'm there. So. I'm sitting there, I'm eating cheese fries, tater tots, all the good stuff, and you can even play a virtual course. So my dad and I, we were at Spyglass Hill in California, here in Utah, and we're playing this virtual course. And it was amazing to me, because no matter which club I used, or how hard I swung it, or whatever I did, each hole, I was faithful to get a double bogey. And if you've never played golf, you're saying, double bogey? Pastor Joe, that sounds amazing. It is amazing. It's twice as many bogeys as one bogey. But if you're playing golf, you're saying, we're never golfing with that man ever. And I wouldn't blame you. But I was faithful every time to get the same result. And just as I was faithful in golf, we see that Paul is faithful in ministry. Paul was faithful in ministry. Throughout our study in Acts, we've seen multiple instances where Paul has shown faithfulness to do what the Lord commanded him to do. Now granted, his little dispute with Barnabas was not a highlight moment in his ministry, However, the fact remains that we've seen Paul's faithfulness on display time and time again. So in our text this morning, we find yet another example 
of Paul's faithfulness to follow Christ and live out the Lord's calling on his life. In fact, there were five instances or five examples in our text this morning that I saw where Paul was faithful to obey Christ. So what I'd like us to do during our time together this morning is really review these five instances together and see Paul's faithfulness here in Corinth. Maybe we too can find out how we can be faithful and trust the Lord and obey him based on the example that we see from Paul's own life in his ministry. So for those note takers in the room, the first thing I want us to see is that Paul was faithful to do the work. Paul was faithful to do the work. If we look again at the first four verses, we see that. It says, after this, he left Athens and he went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both the Jews and the Greeks. Paul was faithful to do whatever it took to continue proclaiming the gospel, including working a vocational job. Paul had been a tent maker in the past, so when he found them, he continued working in tent making with them. In these opening verses of verse 18, we see Paul arriving in Corinth, after which he quickly finds this couple, Priscilla and Aquila. They're living in Corinth because Claudius expelled all the Jews living in Rome due to a major conflict, which Bible scholars believe centered around Jesus Christ and whether or not he was the Messiah. So in order to keep the peace, Claudius kicks all the Jews out of Rome so that he doesn't have to listen to everyone argue anymore. As a result, Aquila and his wife Priscilla have moved to Corinth. And they've opened up the first A&P store in town. That's a grocery store joke for the two of you that got it. <laughs> if you read your Bible before, if you've read your Bible, then you're probably familiar with these two faithful things. Now, we don't know whether Priscilla and Aquila were Christians before they were exiled from Rome or whether they became Christians as a result of Paul's faithful witness here in Corinth. We don't know for sure. Luke is silent on this issue. But what we do know, though, is that at some point these two do become Christians because we're going to read more about them and how they continued to assist Paul in ministry later on in our study here through Acts. Maybe even today you find yourself in a similar situation to Paul. Sure, none of us in this room are probably working as tent makers, but regardless of what your nine-to-five job is, each one of us has been called to share the gospel with those around us. Earlier this week, I heard a story about Philip Armour. Philip Armour. Philip Armour was the founder of the Armour meatpacking industry in the late 1800s, early 1900s. This is back in the day when you could own a monopoly. And because of his successful meatpacking business, Mr. Armour not only owned a monopoly, but he basically ran Chicago. So one day, Mr. Armour's traveling. He's traveling on a train, and he's sitting beside a young businessman. This young businessman is in his 20s. He has no idea who he's sitting next to. So the two of them just kind of strike up a conversation, and as they're talking, this young businessman asks Mr. Armour what he did for a living. What do you think his response was? Mr. Armour's response was amazing. Mr. Armour turned to the young businessman and said, my job is to tell people about Jesus Christ. I just pack a little beat on the side. <laughs> Church, our careers should not define who we are. The work that we do in order to pay our bills or keep a roof over our head should serve as a secondary purpose to our primary mission of telling others about Jesus Christ. As Christians, each one of us is an ambassador of Christ, and we have been commissioned by the King to proclaim the saving message of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. It doesn't matter if you're an accountant, if you work in IT, or your job stocking grocery store shelves, or sorting nuts and bolts, or if you're a Hollywood movie star, our primary task is to proclaim the gospel. Even when he was making tents during the week to put food on the table, Paul's primary task was sharing the gospel. In fact, that's the next thing I want us to see from our text this morning. The second thing Paul did was he was faithful to preach the word. Look again at verses 4 through 8. Verses 4 through 8, it says, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes, and he told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Justice, a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. 
Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord along with his whole household. And catch this, many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed, and were baptized. Paul was faithful to preach. Even when he gets run out of the synagogue, he continues preaching. Paul was faithful to proclaim the gospel. Paul committed himself to preaching the word of God. From the very beginning, we see Paul proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus in the synagogue every Sabbath. Week in and week out, Paul can always be found at the synagogue on Saturday. He works hard making tents throughout the week so that he can eat, so he can have a roof over his head. But then when the weekend comes, he spends his day off proclaiming the gospel and reasoning with the Jews. Then, as soon as Timothy and Silas show up, Paul's able to shift some things around and spend even more time preaching the gospel. According to Bible scholars, it's very likely that when Paul's missionary companions arrived in Corinth, they brought with them some financial aid to help support Paul in his missionary efforts here in Corinth. Either that or maybe Timothy and Silas found jobs as well, and so it freed Paul up to spend less time making tents and more time preaching the gospel. Whatever the case may be, Luke tells us that Paul was committed to preaching the gospel, and as a result, lives were transformed by the power of the gospel. Despite the fact that many of the Jews started blaspheming against God and resisting the gospel, Luke tells us here in verse 8 that a very prominent, very important Jewish leader hears the gospel, believes in Christ, and is saved. How incredible is that? <coughs> Excuse me. Based on what we see happening here in the life of Crispus, we too should be praying for non-believing leaders and rulers. Based on what we see here in Acts, we should be praying for the salvation of religious leaders around the world. If God can do it then, God can still do it today. The fact that the ruler of the synagogue was converted just adds more weight to the incredible truth that the gospel is powerful enough to transform the lives of anyone and everyone. By the world's standards, Christmas had nothing to gain and everything to lose by rejecting Judaism and following Christ. And yet that's exactly what he did. And Christmas wasn't the first religious leader that we see the Lord save here in the book of Acts. If you were to go back and read the beginning of Acts, you'd see how in one moment Paul was the greatest threat to Christianity. And in the next, he was the biggest advocate for the gospel. The gospel changes us. It changes lives. It transformed Paul's life, and it changed Christmas's life as well. And it changes our lives too. So what was this gospel message? What was the gospel message that Paul was preaching? What did Paul say that caused Crispus and his entire household, along with many other Corinthians, to believe in the Lord and be baptized? Thankfully, we don't have to speculate. Paul tells us in a future letter that he writes to the Corinthian church exactly what the message was that he was preaching when he arrived in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 2, it says, When I came to you, this is Paul speaking, he said, Brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or, or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul preached Christ and him crucified. Paul proclaimed the message that Christ is our substitute. Paul shared with Crispus, his household, and everyone in Corinth who would listen how Christ's atoning work on the cross paid the price for our sins and redeems us from the punishment each one of us so justly deserves. As a result, their lives were transformed by the power of the gospel. People believed and they were saved. If you're sitting here today and you have questions about how this works, come talk to me. Let's have a conversation after service about what it means to follow Christ and let him be your substitute in life. Paul taught the word of God. He preached Christ and him crucified. And through his faithful proclamation of God's word, we see the gospel transform lives, including that of the religious leaders in Corinth. Which leads me to my third observation. The third thing I want us to see this morning is that Paul was faithful to trust God. Look again at verses 9 through 11. Paul was faithful to trust God. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you or hurt you, because I have many people in this city. So he stayed there a year and a half teaching the word of God. Paul was faithful to trust God. 
Missionary work, you heard Pastor, is hard. Missionary work is hard. You heard Pastor Brian this morning talk about how hard it is. The work Paul was doing was difficult. Paul has faced relentless opposition in every town that he's visited. If you're sitting here today and you're under the impression that Paul never got discouraged, that he never got depressed, he never felt defeated, you're greatly mistaken. There were times when Paul struggled. Once again, if we look at his letter to the Corinthian church later on, we see that he admits that he dealt with weakness, he dealt with fear, and much trembling during his time in Corinth. As a result, the Lord appears to him in a night vision to encourage him, to sustain him, and strengthen him for the work of ministry. After which point, Paul could have done one of two things. One, he could have ignored God, shrugged off the dream as nothing more than kind of a result of a late night, midnight snack. Or he could choose to trust God, hear what he was saying to him, and be encouraged by it and press on. In the end, we see that Paul trusted God, that he was encouraged by the Lord's word, because verse 11 tells us that Paul stayed in Corinthia in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching and preaching the word of God. Rather than continue being afraid, Paul trusted God. As followers of Christ, we don't need to fear the world, because our king sees us, and he cares for us. God loves his people, and as God's people, we can trust in him. By putting his faith and trust in God, Paul was able to stand firm against future opposition. That's the fourth thing I want us to see from our text this morning. Paul was faithful to stand firm. Look again at verses 12 through 17. When Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or of a serious crime, it'd be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words or names or your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Slosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But none of these things mattered to Galileo. Paul was faithful to stand his ground. He was faithful to stand firm against persecution for the sake of the gospel. If you'll notice in verse 14, despite the united attack by the Jews against Paul, he was both willing and he was ready to defend himself and the gospel against his persecutors. But before Paul could even open his mouth, Galileo cut him off and put an end to the matter immediately. I'm not sure which laws Paul was speaking against that the Jews were angry about. Luke doesn't really go into detail about this dispute. But whatever the case was, Galileo was not about to involve himself in this matter. Quite the opposite, in fact. As far as the governor was concerned, it was not the government's job to intervene in these religious issues. For Galileo, Christianity was just another form of Judaism. Therefore, they could settle this matter among themselves. So, Galileo sends the Jews away and dismisses their case against Paul. As you can imagine, the Jews were not very happy about this. And as a result, they decide to take their frustration out on Slosthenes. Not Paul, Slosthenes. Poor guy. Here's where I want us to pause, though. Here's where I'd like us to pause for just a moment. If we were reading through the book of Acts on our own at home, it'd be really easy to blow past verse 17 and continue reading on to the next pericope about Paul's third missionary journey. But if we don't stop to reflect on Sosthenes and the perilous predicament that he's found himself in, I fear that we might be doing ourselves a grave danger. That being said, I want to preface what I'm about to share with the following disclaimer. Scripture is not clear on who Sosthenes here is here in verse 17. Other than Luke stating that he's the leader of the synagogue, we don't know much more about him. But the name Sosthenes is mentioned again in the Bible. In fact, it's our very own gospel crusader, Paul, who references a man named Slosthenes in his first letter to the Corinthian church later on in his ministry. In Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says this. Paul, called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Slosthenes, our brother. Interesting. 
In which case, the only question we should possibly be asking ourselves in light of all this is how many guys named Slosthenes have you ever met? How many guys named Slosthenes do you know? Not only that, but how many guys named Slosthenes do you think are living in Corinth? It's not like his last name is Smith. Once again, this is completely conjecture. But humor me as we kind of travel down this hypothetical road together. Could it be, could it possibly be in God's grace and sovereignty that the man flogged and beaten by the rioting Jews, the Slosthenes that we read about here in Acts 18, is the same Slosthenes that we read about a handful of pages later in Paul's letter to the Corinthian church? The reason I ask, and the reason this question has been keeping me up at night all week, is I just have to know. I just got to know, who is Slosthenes? Because the Slosthenes that we read about here in Acts 18, verse 17, Luke tells us is the leader of the synagogue. So, without getting ahead of me here, if, in God's sovereignty and his grace, the same Slosthenes that is the leader of the Jewish synagogue here in Acts is the same Slosthenes who is the brother of Christ in 1 Corinthians 1, that can only mean one thing, and one thing only. Slosthenes got saved. Slosthenes got saved. I'm worried that you're not really tracking with me here, so let me explain this a little clearer. Paul arrives in Corinth, where Crispus serves as the Jewish leader of the synagogue. The Jews are blaspheming and resisting the gospel message that Paul's proclaiming. So Paul says, forget you guys, I'm only going to share the gospel with the Gentiles from here on out. After that, he meets up with a worshiper of God named Justice, who just so happens lives next door to the synagogue. Weird, right? Then, as Paul and his buddy Justice are proclaiming the gospel at their house church next door to the Jewish synagogue, it just so happens that Crispus, the leader of the Jews, gets saved. Sorry. What I meant was not only does Crispus get saved, but his entire household gets saved as well. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. That isn't right. What I'm trying to say is Paul and Justice, they have this church plan, right? It's meeting in their house, which is next door to the Jewish synagogue. And while they're preaching the gospel there, Crispus, along with his entire household, gets saved. And many Corinthians hear the gospel, and they get saved as well. But it doesn't end there. Because... Later on, the Jews get together and they plan this massive attack against Paul, which unfortunately for them does not go their way. So, as a result, rather than beat Paul up, drag him out of town, these people take their frustration out on Crispus's replacement, the current leader of the synagogue, a man named Slosthenes, which means absolutely nothing unless, unless you consider the possibility that the Christian man named Slosthenes, that Paul refers to in his letter to the Corinthian church, is the Jewish man named Slosthenes here in Acts 18, 17. In which case, it can only mean one thing. Slosthenes got saved. Either he got saved before he was seized and, uh, seized and beaten in front of the tribunal, or he got saved after he was seized and beaten in front of the tribunal. Either way, the Holy Spirit got a hold of him, and the Lord rescued him out of darkness and brought him into the marvelous light, which means that Sosthenes heard the gospel, accepted it, and believed. Which, for better or worse, just leads me to speculate that Sosthenes probably got saved before he was beaten by the Jews, which would explain why they chose to take their frustrations out on him rather than Paul in the first place. Sosthenes was probably already leaning towards Christianity, which is why the Jews gathered together to formulate this united attack against Paul. They had already lost one leader to the gospel. They weren't about to lose a second one. They needed to put an end to this nonsense before it turned their whole town upside down. I said it before and I'll say it again. God's got the whole thing rigged. God's got the whole thing rigged. He's got the whole thing rigged for our good and for his glory. Paul was faithful to proclaim the gospel in Corinth. And as a result, lives were transformed. People were saved, including the religious leaders in town. The next and final thing I want us to see today is that Paul was faithful to stay the course. Paul was faithful to stay the course. If we just tiptoe a little bit through the opening verse of next week's text, we'll clearly see that Paul was faithful to persevere and remain committed to the gospel. In Acts 18, verse 18, it says, After staying for some time, 
Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters and sailed away to Syria. Paul was faithful to stay the course. Paul remained in Corinth for some time, despite the persecution, despite the organized attack by the Jews, and despite all the headaches and difficulties surrounding Paul. He was faithful to stay the course and continue proclaiming the gospel in Corinth. Earlier in verse 11, Luke tells us that Paul was in Corinth for at least 18 months. I'm not sure exactly how much time in total Paul spent ministering here in Corinth, but we know that he stayed long enough to encourage the saints and to strengthen them in the word of God. This is quite the shift for Paul. This is quite the shift from his typical response. If you remember from our previous chapters of Acts, in the past few towns that we've seen Paul visit, when there's persecution and the townspeople threaten to stone him, or actually do in fact stone him and drive him out of town, Paul shows no hesitation about getting back up and moving on to the next stop on his missionary journey. But here in Corinth, however, we see a different decision on Paul's part. Rather than leave when the going gets tough, Paul makes the decision to stay, continue sharing the gospel until the Lord directs him to move on. This serves as a subtle, yet a great reminder that God in his sovereignty may give us longer seasons in some places than in others. Wherever we are and however long we're there, I want to encourage you to remain faithful, to share God's word, and to make disciples by pointing others to Christ and proclaiming the gospel in the times and the places where God has positioned you. This morning we've seen all the various ways that Paul was faithful. He was faithful to do the work necessary to continue proclaiming the gospel. He was faithful to preach the word and proclaim the gospel both to Jews and to the Gentiles. We saw that Paul was faithful to trust God and how he was faithful to stand firm, even when there were massive attacks brought against him. In the end, we saw how throughout all of this, Paul was faithful to stay the course and to remain in Corinth longer than he did anywhere else on his missionary journey until the Lord released him and directed him to move on to the next town. After looking at Paul's incredible examples of faithfulness and his trust in the Lord, it'd be really easy for me to stand up here and challenge us all to be faithful, just as Paul was faithful. In fact, I could probably come up with some really catchy, sticky statements like, don't let your faithfulness falter, or don't peter out and deny Christ, but persist like Paul and persevere until the end. And as great as that all would be, and as easy and as an application point as being faithful would be, I'm afraid that in the end, it would not bring honor to God's word or to the main point that Luke is intending here for his readers. Or don't get me wrong, we should be faithful. As Christians, we must be faithful to do the work of an evangelist, to preach the word, to trust God, to stand firm, and to stay the course. But many, if not all of us in the room today, already know that. So I don't want to just tack on an application to my message this morning. Especially because I believe Luke, and in turn God, would have us see something so much greater than that today. The main point that I want you to take away from our time in God's Word together this morning isn't that we should be faithful like Paul was faithful, but rather that God strengthened Paul for the work of ministry. God sustained Paul for the work of ministry. I believe that's the main point that Luke is trying to convey here. And I believe that's the main point that God would have us share, have me share with you from his word this morning as well. The Lord strengthened Paul and he equipped Paul for the work of ministry. I don't know if you underline or if you highlight in your Bible, but if you do, I'd encourage you to highlight these verses, verses 9, 10, and 11. Because apparently at some point I highlighted these verses in my Bible months ago. At some point I highlighted these verses during one of my devotional times, and I'm glad that I did. Because in preparing this message, these three verses I saw actually act as a hinge. They act as connecting tissue to our entire story today. Everything that Paul was able to accomplish while he was in Corinth, all of his faithfulness during his time here, is centered around, or is a direct result, of what the Lord said to Paul here in verses 9, 10, and 11. If we look at those one more time, we see the Lord speaking to Paul in a night vision. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking, and don't be silent, for I am with you. 
No one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. So he stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. Don't be afraid. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you. No one will hurt you. God strengthened and encouraged Paul for the work of ministry. As I mentioned earlier, Paul boldly admits that when he came to Corinth, he did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom, but that he came to them in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Weakness, fear, trembling. How in the world could Paul possibly have been faithful to do all the things that we've just seen him accomplish if he was full of weakness and fear and trembling? Simple, really. God encouraged Paul. God prepared Paul for the struggles that were ahead of him. How did he do that? He appeared to Paul in a night vision and said, don't be afraid. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you. No one will hurt you. I can kind of picture how this conversation between God and Paul went in his dream. I can picture Paul saying, but Lord, I don't have brilliance of speech or wisdom. I can just see God replying, shh, don't be afraid. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. I'm with you. No one will hurt you. Paul was able to be faithful because God strengthened and encouraged him. Church, maybe you're sitting here today, and the very thought of telling you your coworkers about Jesus on Monday terrifies you. Maybe you're sitting here today, and the thought of sharing the gospel with a neighbor or even a stranger is frightening to you. The good news is you're not alone. Chances are many of us in the room, when faced with the thought of proclaiming the gospel, find ourselves filled with feelings of weakness, of fear, of trembling. In which case, if we were to take a deep breath and listen closely, I believe we would hear the Holy Spirit's voice whisper in our ear, don't be afraid, keep speaking, don't be silent, because I am with you. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you're facing challenges greater than you ever imagined. Maybe you're in a season right now where you feel like you are literally walking through the valley of the shadow of death and you don't know what to do. If that's you, then maybe what you need to do is close your eyes, let go of your fears, put your trust in God because God's word tells us that we don't need to fear because he is with us. Church, Paul was faithful because God strengthened him to do the work that he had been called to do. In the same way, we too can be faithful to do the work that God is calling us to do because the Lord will strengthen us. He will sustain us and he will equip us for what is ahead of us, just like he did Paul. All we have to do is not be afraid, put our trust in God, and continue moving forward because God is with us. He is faithful God is faithful to equip us and strengthen us for the work he's prepared for us to do. All we have to do is simply put our hope in him. Paul was faithful because he is faithful. And because God is faithful, we too can be faithful. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the example that we saw in Paul's life today. Lord, I, I thank you that Paul's faithfulness was not because of his own work or his own efforts, but Lord, because of the work that you're doing inside of Paul's life. Lord, that you sustained him for ministry, that you strengthened him. Lord, that you encouraged him to keep pressing forward even when times got hard. Lord, today I, I pray for our church. I pray for us this morning. I lift us to you today. I pray that you would strengthen us, Lord Jesus, that you would encourage us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just guide us and lead us and comfort us. Lord, whenever we get nervous or afraid to, to proclaim the gospel and, and, and share the saving message of Jesus Christ, Lord, I, when the chatterbox rages in our head, I pray that we would just silence it with your voice telling us, don't be silent, keep speaking, I am with you. Dear Lord, I pray for those in our faith family who are struggling, who are hurting, or maybe dealing with sickness or illness, or, or just obstacles in their life that feel like they're impossible to overcome. Lord, I pray that in these seasons of difficulty, you would encourage them, strengthen them,
Let them know that you are with them. I thank you that your word says you never leave us, you never forsake us, you never abandon us. Help us to put our trust, our hope, not in the things of this world, Lord, but in you and you alone. Help us to walk with you, to trust in you, and to believe in you. It's in your holy and precious name, Lord, I pray. Amen.